Five years ago, I met a fascinating woman named Mariam. You may have seen the episodes I filmed on nomadic tribes in the Atlas Mountains, or crashing a Moroccan wedding and being in tears over the story of Hafida. But on that same trip five years ago, I went to the home of Mariam, an American who one day decided, with very little money and plenty of doubts, to move her family to Marrakesh. Mariam's philosophy on life and approach to making the move to a foreign country, when often it can seem so much easier to just stay where we are, is compelling motivation for any dream, grand or humble, whether moving to a little Moroccan village or just a new city in your home country, whether you're passionate and clear on your goal or lying awake at 3 a.m. asking yourself if the whole dream is a fool's plan. you end up here because your your mother is from Iran is that yes correct? Yeah. my mom's from Iran and my yeah. dad's from New York okay and I was posted here for a job so my background is in humanitarian aid okay and I was living in Namibia where I was running a program and I was posted here to do humanitarian aid work for the NGO that I work for okay and we moved here not knowing anything about the place so, oh, so you were already married to your husband at that I was point, married right? to my husband and we were living together in Namibia, mm -hmm. and I got a call one day that said, you know, there's an opening in Morocco, and I turned to my husband and I said, what do you know about Morocco? And he <laughs> said, nothing. <laughs> and I said, great, me too, let's go. And we, we literally moved here with our son, sight unseen. Wow. You know, I think just as travelers, we're, you know, adventurers and mm -hmm. nomads and gamblers, and this just seemed like our, our next great adventure. But the issue is that when you do the kind of job that I do, you normally get reposted every few years. Yes. And by then, we had just been so sucked into this place. Really? And I said, I don't think I want to leave. I yeah. want to live here. And so we started trying to figure out how to live here. Did that love affair happen immediately? Like almost when you immediately. Off the plane? Almost really? immediately. I think I felt so comfortable with the culture, you know, I'm, um, you know, having an Iranian mom. Yes. I was born in Cairo. Wow. So I knew the region pretty well, and yeah. it just felt, it felt sort of like a, a new, fascinating, um, but very comfortable home. And, 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 and yet it's still a place which most people in the world would, would, would perceive as being very exotic. It's very, yeah. it's, it's not normal to, to raise a family in, in, in Morocco. Well, no, I know, but I think that we have such an amazing opportunity. I think mm -hmm. life is really short and people spend a lot of time living in their cubicle yeah. doing the same things <laughs> that their parents did. Yes, and yes. that's not at all the kind of life that we have wanted to live. Mm -hmm. And so Morocco seems like the perfect home base for us. You know, great food, beautiful weather, really kind people, and yeah. the architecture and design is so striking, and I'm a big design aficionado. So. And your husband's an architect. And my right? husband's yeah. an architect, and now, you know, I do, I have a book called Marrakesh by Design. I've seen it. It's and, beautiful. Uh, thank you. <laughs> and I think that it's really it just had all of those elements that we wanted, and our kids are taking you know, an hour of French and an hour of Arabic every day at school. Yes. And wow. it just seemed like a really good way to grow them into world citizens and for us to, you know, keep, kind of keep the magic going. So yeah. Yeah. We, we, haven't, we haven't moved and now we've built Peacock Pavilion. So I think we will perhaps, this, is, this might be our last stop. Wow, wow. Yeah. And tell me, I mean, how... Were there any sort of difficulties? I mean, of culturally, course, what, I mean, of course, it, it, so I'm looking many. around at this 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 heavenly place, and and that you and and you, I've know, I've just met you, your husband, and it seems it, it seems like paradise. But but I mean, oh it, my goodness! So I have a blog called My Marrakesh. Yes. And if you read back into it when we were building this place. There's a whole series called The Disaster Chronicles. Okay. You know, everything went wrong. Our contractor spent all of our money eight right. months into the project. Yes. We, my husband had to take over a crew of 20 people. We had to kind of take out another mortgage. We thought everything was lost. And then my parents came through with a major loan. 
and and then I started getting really interesting side jobs. Yeah. You know, working in design mm -hmm. and writing for magazines and all of a sudden, all of the pieces came together. Yeah. And, you know, I think the universe rewards you when you're brave, you yeah. know? Yeah. And just in order to keep us on this path, things started really happening for us. Yeah. And so, despite the many disasters, you know, stairs put in entirely wrong, windows all put in upside down, you know, we had to do a lot of things over and be scrappy, but... I think it's resulted in a guest house and a house that's entirely handmade because we made it. Yeah. Right down to every single paper on the property, my husband made a mold for and poured the cement. All of the domes and arches in our place were all handmade, oh, wow. hand molded. You know, I feel like even just the way I, I dress is very much about this place. Yeah. I mean, Marrakesh is the kind of place that makes you take risks, mm -hmm. makes you take personal risks, makes you take professional risks, and so many of the people who live here, so many of the expats who live here are on their second or third life. You know, they used to be stockbrokers, yeah. and now they run an export company out of America. Sure. What, you know, what do you think it is? What is it that, that makes people want to be courageous what is it that makes people want to, to live a life that is romantic and audacious? <laughs> well, I think part of the reason is that we're so surrounded by those kinds of people here. So, right. you know, writers and filmmakers and chefs mm -hmm. and dress designers or handbag designers. And so, so many of the people who live here are in the creative industry. I mean, historically, and Morocco is always attracted artists, yes, hasn't it? It's absolutely. Like, it's, and it just continues. It's just on a new wave. Yeah. So I think when you're surrounded by people who are sparkling and like creating new businesses and so many of them are entrepreneurs that mm -hmm. you start moving in that direction yourself. Wow. And you know, I you know, you were saying earlier, like I do so many things and it's really true because you know, it's and it's really thanks to Marrakesh. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think if I if I lived, you know, in Boston or in Florida, I yeah. probably just wouldn't be this way. You well, know? it's interesting, isn't it? Because one might think, okay, if you if you were to live in a city, uh, in a in an Anglo-Saxon country, that perhaps you would have more projects and get more work done. But I don't know about that. I mean, for me, I've spent many many years living in Italy, mm -hmm. and I find the same thing. People say, how can you leave the city? But it, when you're somewhere that is so inspiring, you just become more productive, no? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I think that um, the other great thing about living in a place like this is that not every niche is filled. Mm. There's so many things left to do. There's so many business opportunities. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, I think that you, you don't kind of get stuck in a rut here. You can recreate yourself a thousand times. Because it's, it's sort of developing that you can be a part of that process mm -hmm. you know it's not sort of at that state where you know there's there's a hundred people doing what you'd like to do sure, there sure. really aren't so you can be a pioneer what is it like uh, to to be an expat here and and is it very much i mean the the local people and the expats in a in a in a in their in own more isolate, isolated bubble i mean it, as, as it is in many countries sure so. I mean, I think we're a little bit special because we're social entrepreneurs. Yeah. So we have our own charity, which is all about being a part of the community. Yeah. So I think that we very much don't want to have that feeling. We don't want to be this big house in the village. We yeah. want to be neighbors in this village. So we mix a great deal with, yeah. with our community. And um, so our project is you know, called Project SOAR. We work with about... 60 girls yeah. who come and see us every week and we do fitness with them, health education mm -hmm. and a creative activity. So art mm -hmm. of some form. We also work with their moms right. and the, the idea is that in this village there are many of the, many of the women who live here were girl brides right. and 
we're really trying to break the cycle of girl brides here. Right. So in order to participate in Project SOAR activities, you have to stay in school. And mm -hmm. that's so, and our goal is to get 25 plus of our girls into university and to kind of have them lift up this community, yeah. you know, as a central part of their, of their futures. And so I think, you know, I think you have to make the choice when you're an expatriate to yeah. either live on the fringe and live on the outside yeah. or to really try to, you know, get in and understand the culture from the inside. Mm -hmm. And I think Project Soar has been a great channel for us to do that. Yeah. I, I was reading about it. It sounds, yeah, it it's sounds cool. wonderful. No? It's a really cool project. But also quite ambitious. I mean, uh, it is. It's, uh, is it, I mean, are there, are there sort of difficulties? What, what, what are you? Well, I think we were very careful about how we approached it. This is such a conservative village. And right. in fact, there was an imam here who was run out of town by the state because he was so conservative, what right. he was preaching. Right. And so, you know, he really wanted women to, um, to not go out unless it was absolutely necessary for, for even small girls to veil. Mm -hmm. And he kind of, the baseline was, was really, really super traditional and conservative. Right. And so we wanted to kind of channel my 20 plus years of humanitarian aid and to try to learn what the lesson was. So yeah. we wanted to be very respectful mm -hmm. and we went to the village elders mm -hmm. and presented our project. And it was really through them. They were the ones that went to the village and asked the villagers, would they like to do this? Right. And um, when we got a positive response, it was the village elders who brought us our first batch of girls. Mm. And I think because of that, because we chose to, instead of kind of imposing on the village yeah. our own way of doing things, we really wanted it to be a partnership with yeah. the village, and I think that that's, that's made all the difference. Tell me, tell me about your, your own children. You have a, a boy and a girl? Right? I do. Skylar, my daughter, who's 13, was really actually the inspiration for Project SOAR. It's a really important way for her. She, Skylar was born here in Morocco. Right. To, to, to not be so much on the, on the fringes of this society, but to be a part of it. Yeah. And also to really have her embrace service as a, you know, as a, as a goal and an yeah. objective. You know, I've devoted my career to humanitarian aid and my dad did that before me right. and really showed me that. Yeah. And so, and I think that's really my hope for the future, yeah. which yeah. is that everybody will just give a little and yeah. contribute a little and yeah. provide a little sweat equity and, yeah. You know, so I think it's been a great experience for Skylar. Mm -hmm. My son is 15, mm -hmm. and he's also at the American school. And if you go to the American school here, it's amazing. It's like a little UN. Oh, really? You know, my son's best friend at school is Syrian. My daughter's best friend is half Swedish and half Moroccan. Mm -hmm. And it's a really great kind of melting pot of different cultures and yeah. peoples and you know, with a very good dose of Moroccans, of course. Sure. And I think that it's made them so much more open mm -hmm. as as people. When you travel uh, yeah. for, for work and you come mm -hmm. back to Morocco, does it it feels like home to you? Of now? course, yeah. this is my home. Yeah. You know, I'm, and you know, most people are born into their homes, and I feel really lucky that I got to, ch you know, got to choose mine. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like a parent who adopts a child after wanting one for so long, yes, you yes. know? And so this is a very deliberate choice yes, yes. On, on my part. So I appreciate it so much. Mm -hmm. You know, I feel an incredible sense of gratitude yeah. to to this place, you yeah. know, for, for letting me live here. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's only been, of course, there are challenges, just like, you know, life has challenges, yeah. but overall, it's been an amazing experience, and I'm, I feel really fortunate to be able to kind of pass on that adventure and that journey to my kids. I mean, maybe it'll just be inspiration for them to pick up and move to Mozambique. Yes. You know, <laughs> but the whole idea that this is a very doable option. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's nothing, the world is a big and amazing 
beautiful place. Mm -hmm. And so why, why pigeonhole yourself? I absolutely agree. And a lot of people think, oh, no, but I can't do that because yeah. I don't have the, the context of the money. Or the, sure. But I, I feel like if you have a passion for a, a country, there is always a way and the people will recognize the love you have for their culture yeah. and they will they will help the universe will help you or they exactly. will help you I, I, I it's like the universe that, rewarding yeah. you when you're brave but I also think that even asking yourself even putting the equation out that way mm. is putting it out backwards so to say I really would like to do I really love to move you know to uh, Niger uh -huh. but I don't have the money I don't have the language skills it's just the wrong way of putting it. What yeah. you need to say is, I'm going to move to Niger. So what do I need to do to get there? I need to learn the language. I need to raise some money. Mm -hmm. So it's not a if I had, but when I go there, you know, what will I need? Absolutely. It's just about flipping the equation. Yes. You know, yeah. I never, and I think that money should never, money is the last reason to hold you back mm -hmm. you know there's always a way I feel like in fact because we were so broke here mm -hmm. I got really scrappy yeah. and I started doing all of these things that I might not have done you know I started writing for magazines I got my book deal yeah. I started doing design work I started designing you know not only homes but products all of those things I you know kind of put myself out there yeah and you know once you once you get once you do something brave, once you do something that scares you mm -hmm. and you're successful, then everything opens up for you because you know that you can do it. And it's know? impossible to be complacent from that point on, is exactly. it? Exactly. <laughs> That's what I, I love too. Exactly. You, you feel like every every year of your life is, is a gift and what are you going to do with it? Yeah. Where are you going to go? Who are you going to, to meet? And Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Also, the other very cool thing about Marrakesh is it's known to be like a magical vortex. So the other one is supposedly over Hawaii. Okay. So people believe that like very special things happen to you if you're open to them. Like I have to tell you this crazy story. So I have a girlfriend <laughs> who lives down the street. She's Egyptian, married to a Moroccan, and she has this like incredible name of long hair, you know, to her waist. It's always her pride and joy. And of course, you know, in the region, hair is very, very important. And so she was talking to me about her about her housekeeper, and she said, the housekeeper's behaving really oddly. I said, like, what's she doing? She's like, she's wearing lipstick and wearing perfume. And I said, oh, you better be careful. Like, she's got her eyes on somebody, and it's not you. <laughs> so she calls me one day, and she's weeping and weeping. I can't even understand what's going on. She said, just come over. And I arrive, and she's hacked her hair off of half of her head. She said that she woke up as if she were in a trance, and with a pair of nail scissors, she had chopped Half her hair off. And this is a really common belief, like that you will be entranced or enspelled. You know, a spell will be cast on you, and then you'll do these things which would make you lose your femininity or lose your attractiveness. Wow. So I hear these stories all the time here. You have to be really careful with your hair yes. and your fingernail clippings because it's very often used in potions against you. Really? Yeah, we actually, we had a former housekeeper who was doing a lot of magic here. We kept finding it and we, we had to fire her, but they take a man's spell. It's a very common spell. And then they add bleach to it and they shake it up and they hide it in places. And it's supposed to make the man like foggy and dazed, you know, entranced with the woman. Right. So, I mean, a lot of it's belief. You know, mm -hmm. I, I was saying to my dad that... You know, people really, really believe in spells and they will have a, a spell cast on them and they'll get deeply sick or even die. And he said, mm -hmm. of course, because they believe a spell has been cast on them. So yeah. they give up all hope. The black magic, of course, stealing people's husbands or boyfriends or, you know, the whole idea of the evil eye is coveting something. Yeah. With where it's like, I really love your skirt, but damn, why don't I look that good in that skirt? Why does she look that, you know? And then it's, so that 
is harmful to you, but that kind of is harmful to you. It's me too. Yeah. It does, you know, you kind of feel like this weird energy, like, yeah, yeah. you know. Mariam speaks with such eloquence and ease and seems so sure of her life path that you could be forgiven for thinking, oh, maybe she isn't someone who suffers from doubt or fear, but you would be wrong. I found her first blog post written back in 2006, and there, with remarkable vulnerability, she recounts the entire process of deciding to move, searching for land, building and being disappointed by roadblocks over and over. In her words back 14 years ago is the same woman who is confident and clear on what she wants but certainly struggling to make it all happen. Back before she had a thriving guest house, a best-selling book, this incredible humanitarian work with Project Saw, she wrote, Do you ever feel like you're spinning your wheels? You're going nowhere fast. That no matter what you do and how hard you try, you always just wind up at square one. Do you ever feel so angry that you really think you would like to just hit something? That the deep breathing techniques learned in yoga class don't seem to be working? That you can't stop recording imaginary dialogues in your head in which you get your revenge on someone who has wronged you? Do you ever feel like perhaps something or someone is trying to tell you something, that you should see the signs because they are right in front of you, that maybe things happen for a reason and that something was just not meant to be? Do you ever feel so sad? that despite your best efforts, you can't manage to quite hide it from your children, that you cry but it doesn't make you feel better, that you wake up in the morning and for a split second you feel happy, but then you remember. Have you ever wanted one thing, just one thing, so much and felt so frustrated because it seemed like you were never going to get it? I hope you enjoyed this interview. Whatever goal you may have right now, to find love, to find work, to change your body, to move to another country. Be brave, execute your dream every day, and don't give up at the first or even the hundredth hurdle. Because like Mariam, you might find that it takes years, but you will eventually reap the fruits of your labor. So don't deny yourself the chance to look back and say, I did it. Mm -hmm.